He's an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Central Michigan University. And his talk is entitled, Economic Analysis of the Oil Industry in the Region, a Preliminary Analysis. Thank you everyone for being here today, for having me as a speaker. Let's see if I can make this thing properly. Uh, so, um, our study is part of a series of studies funded by the Grand Glaze Commission to explore more um, the, uh, the impacts, ecological, economic, and logistics impacts of transporting crude oil in the Great Lake region. Um, and uh, I'm going to present today briefly, um, and please yell at me because I'm an academic, I can't really shut up. Plus, I'm Italian, so that's that compounds it. Um, the results of a work that I co-authored along with Peter Gunther from the University of Connecticut and uh, Dr. Rebelema from Central Michigan University. Um, this is a preliminary analysis. Uh, mostly what we did was to gather data, identify data gaps or mismatches, um, because as we've seen before, we're talking about a region that spans across uh, eight states, two provinces, two nations, multiple federal agencies that may or may not consider the Great Lakes region a region uh, in itself, and they definitely have different definitions for it. So, uh, I will skip quickly through the introduction and objectives, and just uh, because I think the audience pretty much uh, got a good introduction uh, by Professor Hull, um, and focus more on the state of the sector and uh, some other alternative routes or initial economic assessment that we try to, uh, to do, to identify, playing a little bit with the data that we had. Um, so, uh, speakers uh, earlier uh, made quite clear that the Great Lakes region is becoming very, very important, uh, central in uh, hosting a series of um, infrastructure for transporting crude oil. Uh, you see here two graphs, which I really like. Uh, one is for the early crude oil production for oil sands and bucket shale, um, and the other one is uh, a graph showing the exports uh, from Canada into the United States. And Canada is the first exporter of uh, crude oil to the United States, 38% of, oil, of all oil imports according to the EIA. Uh, not all of these necessarily goes to the Great Lakes region, but a good portion of them. And a little bit of uh, previous works that have been done similar to what we're trying to attempt and we would like to do uh, in a phase two region. So, more in that economic impact analysis of the entire uh, industry, the entire sector of transporting crude oil. Um, we identified a few for the region, uh, the Great Lakes region, uh, or for an entire country, as like Canada or the United States. There are far more studies that have been done uh, throughout the years. Uh, for other areas of the country, particularly Texas and Oklahoma, of course, uh, or California. These are a few that are quite recent. Uh, we had um, a few issues that I, we identified with them. Um, they are not of all, not all, all of these studies are independent, meaning they were funded by uh, lobby groups or interest groups, uh, which doesn't necessarily speak to the integrity of the authors, but certainly might raise some concern. Um, sometimes the underlying data sets or models were proprietary in nature, so we can't take them apart. And I like to think that also economists are scientists, so I like to take apart things uh, and data. Uh, many of these studies were regional and local, particularly one that used a fantastic economic regional model called Remy, uh, authored by Clinton, focused on Ohio only, so it was only partly uh, relevant. And uh, not always they put in contrast or necessarily model the alternatives in transportation. Uh, sometimes they only focus on one, uh, one mode of transportation, as you can see there, pipeline or rail uh, and whatnot. Um, for this particular study, we had three main objectives, which was, uh, as I said before, to identify data and collect them. Uh, and we created extensive Excel files that we share with the Great Lakes Commission, and that uh, I'm not presenting them today. Um, we're formatting uh, the data that we found. Uh, we wanted to quantify a little bit, in terms of size, the uh, sector, uh, the composite of industries for transporting crude oil in the region. Uh, we also wanted to have an initial understanding whether or not the industry uh, could 
become relevant uh, for the states in the Great Lakes. Uh, and this is very important given recent news or other economic impact analysis that have been done for major infrastructural projects that involve crude oil transportation in other parts of the United States. Uh, not last in the Dakota Access Pipeline, which according to the latest study by the Brooklyn Institute will provide only full-time permanent jobs. Uh, so is the Great Lakes region down with uh, strength in the industries that are relevant for transporting crude oil or should it look somewhere else? Or it requires perhaps some investments in those sectors. Um, let's skip this. I think they're all literate about that right now. Um, so the Great Lakes region per se uh, already for us and I arrived at the Great Lakes region in Michigan in July and there was already a question of area definition. Now, this is not to be a pedantic academic, but for us it's, it's quite important. Like, how big is that? Uh, do we go, do we follow just the uh, political boundaries of the states and the provinces? Fine. Uh, but certainly my data, uh, the data on jobs, employment, and so forth, will start look a little bit funny, perhaps, because I start having a lot of people employed in the financial sector. Thank you, thank you New York, and also Philadelphia. Um, I'm starting seeing some uh, fun facts, funny facts, uh, in the coal industry, for instance, uh, as many and so forth. Um, so we decided to be a little bit flexible in the area extent. Uh, we used the watershed definition, Great Lakes Region and the Southern Seaway, to expand a little bit more all the way up to the blue line. Um, a little bit. Um, and we also included uh, Chicago and several data sets, the Chicago Metro area, as a separate unit. Reason being that Chicago is the beast of the region, as we said before. However, by watershed definition, only a tiny portion uh, of two counties belong to the watershed. So that's, you can see, it's a little, can create some issues when looking at today. Uh, and then the rest, we mapped here, uh, pink areas, of course, are belonging to the United States, the uh, bluish one belonging to Canada, uh, and we excluded portions of Quebec and, uh, and Ontario, which belong more to the subarctic sub or Atlantic regions. Um, this is the final uh, structure of the data that we collected, massive amounts of Excel files, as I said before, from various sources, including the Department of Transportation, uh, the Freight Analysis Framework, the FAF, uh, U.S. Department of Energy and so forth. The difficulty mainly are two. First of all, as I said before, different agencies on both sides of the border might or may not consider this region as a real standalone region for the Energy Information Administration, which is in my view the best energy uh, agency probably in the world in terms of data. The region itself is split in two, at least. Uh, and so data are collected accordingly. That makes a big difference because the size of the industry changes whether or not they start including the Dakotas in my analysis. You can understand that. Um, similarly, um, there are data mismatches between Canada and the US in terms of definition. What is crude oil? The question that uh, Michelle asked me before a conference, like how much crude oil is transported in the United States and Canada every year? So easy, because data collected by, the, by different agencies give a different definition and aggregate things differently. As I said before, I like taking things apart. Finally, for the United States, uh, it's easy to find data. And I think it's America's data geek, so it makes my life much easier. For Canada, that's not the case. Some of the results I'll show later uh, are based on 20, 2011 uh, accounting matrices. Uh, we have to wait until the end of 2017, I believe, or the next census round to have the updated version of those matrices. There might be local partial data set at provincial level, but they're not good enough for me if I have to think <coughs> uh, in terms of regions. Uh, and also there are some issues with proprietary, uh, proprietary uh, information in relation to even things that in the United States are already available, like the NAICS codes data, or pipeline capacity and actual uh, uh, amount of crude oil transported uh, 
uh, within each province. Those are all data that are far from being easy to be collected um, for, for researchers. So that already creates a little bit of discrepancy, and that's why now I'm treating US states, Great Lakes in the US, and the Great Lakes in Canada as separate entities in parallel. Um, in terms of a last assumption, when I uh, talk about the sectors, the crude oil transportation sector is composed of industries. We use the NAICS coast, North American Natural Classification System. Um, for Canada, it's our four digits equivalent. This is not, again, to be pedantic, but there is already a big difference. Is that refineries at four digit level are, are put together with coal uh, power plants and other sorts of, of power plants. So immediately, my sector is bigger. My refineries look bigger in their economic input because I'm including things that don't use oil. For the United States, we have selected these um, NAICS code instead that are equivalent to these industries over here. Uh, this choice was, um, yes, arbitrary, but based on all the previous studies we've seen before and internal searches, so they are usually accepted as part of the, of the sector uh, or involved in the transportation of the oil. Uh, so let's give some numbers. Um, and these have been uh, actually shown a little bit uh, before. Uh, the region itself, the watershed, for what we, the data we could access, and actually looking forward to the last report and, and then talking a little bit on, on more precise data, and about 2,300 um, um, kilometers of, uh, of pipelines, um, 11 refineries, uh, uh, 49 of our power plants, number of refineries has been counted in terms of financial statements, the way they are filed rather than the actual plant, we'll get a little bit more than that. Uh, seven liquid crossing points as defined by the EIA, uh, 109 on product terminals, uh, and so forth. On the other side here, you see what happens if I start following the political boundaries of the Great Lakes uh, region. Uh, which one is better? It depends on what you're trying to do, um, of course. Now, what does it mean in economic terms? Uh, for uh, the U.S. GLR, so the watershed of the Great Lake region, um, we have about 496 firms uh, that uh, are categorized as being part of those industries that I listed before. Uh, the number is 180 in Canada. Now, for this data set, I had the actual six digits makes, which is great, because it's the way this, this uh, company purchased the data set from and access to the six digits for this particular purpose. Um, that also generally um, creates a basing of 15,000 um, self-reported employees and 11,000 in Canada. So you see in Canada there are a little more uh, employees, a little higher per company. And the total revenues um, are uh, for two and a half billion dollars for the United States. Uh, a little less than five billion for Canada to get watershed. Uh, we are talking about it, and we have Chicago in the last in the last uh, column. Now, it is to say, most actually, I refuse to say this, but most of these revenues uh, come from industries, establishment that are defined as petroleum refineries. So, in the refining process. Now, you may say, well. Wait a minute, you said there are 11 refineries, how come if we have 148 here? That's the way the NAICS codes work. It's because some of these refineries might have multiple firms associated with their location, uh, multiple legal entities, and each one has a different payroll, and a different social security uh, paperwork, and therefore they carry the different, different entities. Um, but the bottom line is that they, be, they provide direct jobs as self-reported, this amount of people, they make up, as you see, most of the revenues in the region. Reason B is because they are the one refining and reselling the final product. That's why they also may have a lion's share in terms of economic impact. We will say in a minute. And then it follows pipeline and transportation, which is uh, quite important in uh, uh, both regions, but I would say you know, the total amount of revenues in uh, a little bit more, um, 1.1 billion dollars uh, every year. These data uh, are for 2016. Um, so 
is it a lot? It's not a lot, but if you gave me $14 billion, I would probably say, yeah, that's a lot of money. Um, for, uh, the, uh, for the sales, that represents 0.36% of all the sales in the region. It's not bad, it's not good. Um, it's, um, it's the way it is. Ideally, to me, I'm a regional economist and an energy economist, the best result would be sales equal zero. Not meaning that they don't sell oil, but meaning that energy is free. That's great, because we can enable a bunch of other things to happen. Um, what is uh, interesting is that, however, uh, most of the companies operating in the watershed are defined uh, as low tech or more classic technology. They're not high tech innovative firms in terms of classification um, by, um, by the group. Uh, so they, they are quite traditional in their in the technology use. They don't engage in necessary high tech uh, groundbreaking advancement. Uh, in the sector. Uh, in terms of jobs, the self-report is 0.1% of the entire region. Um, and um, um, the other thing is that in Canada, in Ontario, Quebec, there are more jobs that relate to uh, planning and designing uh, of the pipelines of the rail and so forth, particularly for this last sector, which contribute to have a slightly higher impact. And this is a visual representation of what we've seen before. Uh, the quantiles relate to income. Uh, as part of the report, we were interested in seeing whether or not these uh, companies uh, concentrate in more urban areas versus rural areas. Uh, and I apologize if the projector might be a little bit messy, <coughs> bigger. Uh, definitely it's better. Um, and you can see that they follow the concentration of urban areas for most part. Chicago here is not, uh, is not included, but uh, we have the Toronto metro area. Detroit uh, along the edges here, from the Detroit areas and so forth, and Montreal up there. Um, now, uh, another aspect that we were looking at is what's the broader view? Okay, we have uh, you know, uh, 6,000 jobs uh, from this industry, that's, that's all interesting, but those jobs support other jobs. The jobs generate uh, an impact. Uh, so we wanted to know where, uh, where the purchase is made uh, for all these, uh, for all these uh, companies. Um, so through a different data set, we started taking apart uh, how things are purchased by these firms. And we saw that uh, for the most part, um, the purchases in terms of value of what is needed by these industries to operate are made from outside of the region. Again, not a surprise, because the lion's share of what all these industries purchase when transporting crude oil is crude oil. Uh, and that's not extracted in the Great Lakes region. Uh, but that has to be taken into account to a certain extent, because basically what this table is showing you is that uh, um, 32, $33 million, uh, more or less, uh, flow out of the region, uh, and the rest uh, comes from inside of the region every year to operate these industries, essentially. Um, in that sense, it's, uh, that's, that's what it means. Um, the other thing that we try to do, but we'd like to do it better, uh, with better data on infrastructure and ecological impacts, are the costs. As I said before, previous studies usually look at benefits, but what about the costs? Uh, what about the costs of spills? What about the costs of life lost? Uh, my understanding, uh, but I, this, this important is that occasion to learn more about it, is that the difference between uh, rail transportation of oil and pipeline is the sound. A pipeline leaks and does pss, and uh, uh, rail accident does boom. Uh, so there are differences, of course, in the impact that that has. Uh, and the way to account for those costs. Uh, and we calculate, we try to calculate the cost of pipeline spills in the region for spills related only to crude oil, so not other, not other refined products. In the region between 2012-2015, we have devastated those back into the 80s. We didn't do that simply to uh, take a modern view, but also to account for changes in technologies, although probably in terms of infrastructure that hasn't been that much of a change. Uh, so for pipelines, Calamazoo oil spill is excluded. But, uh, on 
uh, we go back in time and include that in the costs. And the cost of CO2 emissions, that uh, the travel attractive model for, uh, for this particular, um, for, for the sector, which amount uh, to $146 million a year. Uh, then, of course, that value depends on the value assumed for the per ton social cost of CO2. So my time, I guess, it's, uh, it's done. The, I will jump to the conclusions. Uh, and actually to the next steps, more so than the conclusion. What we'd like to do next is to use um, the regional economic model, uh, Remy, to uh, include health, socio-ecological, and many costs of uh, spills and accidents, not just spills, and also to do a counterfactual analysis of, the, of all the industry. What would happen if transportation of crude oil disappeared? And that would give us the answer of the actual full uh, benefits of the industry throughout the region. Um, what would happen if we started shifting uh, to different nodes? Rail, uh, increased rail, reduced pipeline, and so forth. Um, and then what we'd like to see is to perhaps start pushing for harmonizing data, and why not even revising the way that federal agencies on both sides of the border identify the great age region. It seems to me that it's a region, and treated as such, uh, that would be actually quite useful um, for policy makers, stakeholders to like. Uh, and then, uh, building upon the blue accounting uh, effort in Michigan, perhaps uh, also identifying um, who is, uh, where, the, where is the burden of cleanup costs uh, and soft costs, like brand, for instance, I have a spiel, doesn't, doesn't really sounds very good to attract and retain talent and workers in a, in a certain area. Uh, even after it cleaned out and everything went back to normal. So that would be uh, something interesting to explore. Thank you for your time.